Compared to the Fortress video we did last time that we visited Gen 2, this video is going to be exactly like the Daniel and the Cooler Daniel meme. Today we're going to be taking a look at Scizor and a Pokemon Crystal Solo Challenge. And if you want a rundown of the rules, you can check out the description for a detailed look. But the basics of it is that I can only use Scizor in battle, I can't use items in battle, and the TMs for Double Team and Curse are banned because, let's be real, no one wants to see the same late game just devolve to the same strategy every run. Now just sit back, relax, take a load off, Grab yourself a sodi pop, and I think it's time we just get straight into it. Let's start by taking a deep dive into what makes Scizor tick, and there's going to be a few things that jump out. We talked about how excellent the bug and steel topping was the last time, as long as you can manage the handful of fire top threats in the run, but when you couple it with these stats, the base for this run is kind of set up beautifully. 130 attack is elite, the HP and defenses are solid, and 65 speed is kind of like that little comfortable bar where it's not really going to be a detriment too much. The level up learn set, it does have some standout moves with Swords Dance kind of in the biggest one and it's just because it's not a TM in Gen 2 you really don't see it that often and it just goes without saying that it's a pretty good move to have. The key difference between this and the Fortress run is Pursuit at level 12 which means that today I can proudly announce that we're not going to be hard walled by the second rival fight and we don't have to spend like an hour grinding but I don't want to talk about Fortress anymore. The TM list is Pretty standard, not really much going on here. You get that old trusty swift into headbutt into return progression. We see that pretty much on most runs. And that's pretty much all the information we need about Scizor moving forward. The obvious choice for the rival today is going to be the Cyndaquil line. There's no fire moves yet, so there's no problems. But what I always find interesting about Gen 2 is that it's the second and the third rival fight that matter in this game. After that, he's going to become irrelevant. Whereas in Gen 1, the rivals kind of hit or miss early, and then he starts to hit the stride about the fifth, sixth, or champion fights. But for the first time in a while, there's actually going to be nothing going on right now. It's going to be the bare minimum. We're going to take it to Violet City, and I think we can just go ahead and just jump straight into the first gym. What we have here is what I would like to call a Faulkner problem. And that's where the AI is going to see that Mud Slap is the best choice. This means our accuracy will just get worse and worse the longer the battle goes on. And the decision to not level up and come straight here immediately makes this one a little bit more challenging. But remember, the ultimate goal, guys, is to beat the game as fast as possible. I just go for straight damage here. I don't try to do anything fancy. I end up taking three slaps. We're three stages debuffed to our accuracy. And we just kind of have to outlast the Pidgeotto at this point. I picked up an extra berry and it was kind of like my safety strap for cutting out any extra grinding and you can see that even though we actually get pretty lucky in this battle and we don't really miss at all I still have to use that berry and this one it wasn't clean but it's a 12 minute and 19 second Faulkner split which is not too shabby from there there's gonna be extra battles a lot of extra battles we can pick up seven in total and I'm even counting stuff like the spinners like Pokemaniac Larry and Hacker Anthony and I would love to tell you guys that we could just do the bare minimum here and we could just breeze through every obstacle in the game but we just need a little extra help i do grab swift and i actually i didn't use swift in my first run i didn't think i would need it i was a fool and i thought that fury cutter this was the run that fury cutter was going to be an elite tier move but it wasn't we need swift that's really all there is to it from there i do finish up the slowpoke well and after we battle some gym trainers it's already time for bugsy just like with Fortress, and we'll bring up Fortress a good bit. I'm, I might stop. I don't know. You never know. Scizor, it just has a supreme matchup here. Bug and Steel against his team is too good. Now, as the fight plays out, you're going to see just how dominant it is. I resist everything. And his bugs, they can really only stare in awe as the superior bug is just standing right in their face. But I mentioned this a little bit before, and I'll talk about it now. I really, like, truly in my heart wanted Fury Cutter to actually be useful for this run. It's such a cool move considering. Conceptually, and while it doesn't go the distance in this run, I'm at least going to get to talk about it a little bit soon. Now in the footage, at the very end here, you can see that I'm a little bit shy of level 18, which is intentional, and that's going to take us straight into that second rival fight. 
Gastly is up first, and the good news is that we got Pursuit. The bad news is that our special attack is bad. I cannot one-shot it, and I get put to sleep. And this is actually going to be the preferable status, because you don't want to get licked and get paralysis put on you, because that's going to be a pretty much an instant reset. I level up to 18 after the Gastly, and this lets me hit an all-important 35 speed threshold, because Cool Lava's coming in, and it has 34 speed. And this is our first run-in with Fire, and you just you don't want to play around with it. It's a clean two-shot but you can see just how much damage that Ember does to us. And that's gonna clue you in as to why I had to pick up the extra battles on the way to Azalea. But good planning, good routing, it lets us take care of that. The Zubat comes in later. Honestly, this one wasn't too bad. It doesn't cost us too much time. Now I'm gonna talk about something that's not really that relevant, but it's just like maybe some of my thought process on, on routing for the run. I'm gonna grab Headbutt here, but if you think about it, Return, it's fast approaching, and Swift is only 10 base power weaker. I think you could save a little time, you could skip Headbutt, and you can just kinda of wait it out to Return. I think that's a viable strategy, but you'll see soon enough that when you're doing the bare minimum, you just can't pick up Return on your first Goldenrod trip, so I opted to pick up Headbutt today. They're just, these are little things that I just think about when I'm trying to optimize. And you're gonna see as everything starts to roll out just how long it takes me to actually get return for this run. Outside of busy work like grabbing the bike, getting a haircut, getting the coin case, getting Kenya, we can talk about something that I wanted to talk about in the last crystal video, but Fortress just needed the extra battle so I wasn't able to fit it into the video. And it's the topic of erratic spinners. Now here's some B-roll. I'm gonna go over the manipulation for spinners. It's pretty easy. All you gotta do is pause the game when an erratic spinner is not looking at you. And there's a pretty high success rate even if you're playing at higher speeds, I'm playing on times three speed right now, you can just unpause it and go past them. In this clip, I'm bypassing all the spinners on Route 35 because the second one here specifically, I think is one of the hardest ones in the game to get past. I'm just kind of trying to prove a point here. You'll see me pause, get them in the right position, and then get past them without too much hassle. And I do it front and back. I go all the way, then I just backtrack just to kind of show some consistency. I really wanted to highlight this because during my practice runs, I started thinking to myself, I was like, why even? bother with the manipulation why not just like change the spinner behavior in the code just to make it less tedious and that's exactly what I did now you're gonna see here we're gonna swap to the current run the current build I'm playing crystal on I'm just gonna do laps around the first spinner and this essentially makes the erratic spinners they they're coded to always face away from you you can still battle them if you need the experience and I just want to drive home this point right here that I would not implement this change if I didn't feel 100% confident that I could do the manip nearly every time because it wouldn't feel good otherwise to me personally. I know that there's no right or wrong way to really play a single player game and I don't need to really justify it, but the whole point is that this is something that I could do in the base game, I just made it a little bit less tedious. The huge implication here, and, and I'm gonna stop talking about spinners in a second, is the consistency in routing. Now before the manip and before the changes like this, I was just routing in every erratic spinner into the run because I wanted that consistency. I wanted to know exactly what experience I would be at during a certain point of the run because that's the most important part of optimizing random elements like not knowing if you can get past the spinner honestly made my early crystal runs very stressful and far more bloated than what they should be but what am i trying to say here i guess i'm trying to be transparent with you and just kind of let you guys in on some tweaks that's overall going to make ranking pokemon against each other more accurate and that's very important so let's get past that let's jump straight into whitney and fury cutter fans rejoice get your fury cutter shirts on because now's the time to shine. Now to explain Fury Cutter as quickly as possible, the base power's 10. Each consecutive use of it doubles its power up to a cap of 160. So like 10 to 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 80, you get the idea. We have Bugsy's badge to give it extra damage on top of being a bug type ourselves so we get stab. So we started out at 16 if you noticed. But look here guys, the overlay is now displaying accurate Fury Cutter effective power. I use it three times on the Clefairy and going into the mill tank, we have a four stack which means that we are at 135 effective power. What we've done is essentially beat the cow to the punch here. We turn the tables. It wants to get that rollout power built up, but unfortunately for it, we've already kind of ramped up the Fury Cutter, and this thing is doing some real damage, and it ends the battle very quickly. And I'm just, I'm happy that I found an actual, tangible use for Fury Cutter. The bad news is that this is pretty much the last time we'll ever talk about Fury Cutter in this run again. But when the stars align, and you kind of get a situation like this where you can freely 
completely set up on the Clefairy, assuming that it doesn't get like a fire blast on Metronome. It, it really worked out well. And if you're wondering, I do have the rollout calculations working the same way, but Scissor can't learn rollout, so we'll just have to wait for the next crystal run. But that'll be pretty cool. Here's something that I learned just by kind of playing the game a ton lately, and mainly just kind of messing around with spinners, is that the fire breather next to our boy Juggler Erwin isn't actually an erratic spinner. On this route specifically containing several other spinners, I just kind of always assumed that he was, but you know, you learn something every day and that's just something I thought I would share with you guys. Like all runs, I strive to make this Pokemon look as good as possible, but unlike Fortress who could just do the minimum path and actually look pretty good during this part of the game, Scizor does have to go east and make a little detour. And I just, I really need hidden power right now in this moment to keep things flowing efficiently. It's not a complete waste of time if you really think about it because you would have to go get the flight paths manually at some point anyway. In the upper left area that has hidden power and the rare candy and stuff like that, it's out of the way no matter when you go to it. And when you combine that with teleport or you can just get back to Ecratic City real quick. It just, it really doesn't cost any time at all. And something I would like to talk about while we're here is hidden power, specifically the HP DV. Not hidden power, but like health points. I've tried to record this part like five times, and I swear, every time I try to record this part, I sound worse and worse. I sound more and more like a lunatic, just like raving on the side of the streets, telling you that Jesus is coming back and all that kind of stuff, talking about aliens and tinfoil hats, and I, I'm tired of it. So we're gonna try to get this over with as quick as possible. We're using hidden power ground 12 attack 15 defense now speed and special they never change for my runs they're always 15 so the HP DV not the hidden power we're talking about health points it's just something I've been thinking about I never really thought about it before I started doing codes and stuff like that but if you have an even number in one of those four DVs it's gonna add nothing to the HP DV if those numbers are odd they give a specific value that add up to 15 so for special plus one speed plus two defense plus four attack plus eight in the case of our ground hidden power today we have 12 in attack which is even which means we get nothing and attack is plus eight so we don't get that eight the rest of the numbers add up to seven and what i'm trying to say here and i've tried to say this a lot and i don't even know how this is going to sound but no matter what i'm keeping this part into the video today our scissor has a seven hp 12 attack and then we have 15 in defense speed and special that's our dvs and what's the point of me in bringing this up i just find it interesting and i'm just like ranting and raving like i don't even know how deep this is in the video hopefully it's not too early and I at least get some retention time for it but I don't know I, I wanted to talk about it but I didn't know how to talk about it now I'm gonna have to make up a graphic and now we're getting crazy we're getting so far off the script so what I want to say is that if you don't know how the HP DV works and you just don't really think about it there's a chance you could be using something awful like hidden power fighting and you could be rocking with like a 3 HP DV and you could just be missing a ton of health and you could make certain runs a lot harder than they need to be the TLDR out of all this right I'm gonna I'm gonna hate editing this later the TLDR everybody is that hidden power really affects your HP a lot more than you think but on the flip side of that I really don't think it matters and if I don't think it matters that much then why would I even spend this much time talking about it I don't know we're gonna do like the the men in black mind wipe and we're just gonna move ahead in this run okay are we all in agreement no one mentioned this down in the comments So now that hidden power ramblings are behind us, I took a little break, we're composed now, let's pick back up at the third rival. Despite how easy hidden power ground is going to make this look, and despite how the derived value of HP is still in our mind, this one was actually tough in practice. Relying on pursuit or just not having enough damage to take out Quilava efficiently, it just made this fight kind of like a trap, and it made the detour to the Lake of Rage necessary, and you can see it's paying dividends here. Now we can keep this train rolling straight into more and hidden power ground that's all you need to know this spot even without that it really wasn't even too bad but what's cool about scissor is that after the early grinding so that we can outspeed the quill lava in the second rival fight and then going out of the way just a little bit to get a move we are now just going to be on that straight line path and just overall the pace is about to really pick up After that, we do go down to the Olivine Lighthouse, and that's just gonna take us straight into a brisk swim down to Cinnabar. And I'm just kidding, guys. I know it's Cyanwood this week. I'm not gonna make that mistake again. But before you know it, it's already time for some Chuck, brother, in the next gym. 
This one isn't difficult, but I do take some precautions. As for Primeape doesn't stand a chance, so let's just talk about the important parts of the fight. Remember that Bug and Steel is a great typing, but we are still neutral to fighting. We got that looming dynamic punch hanging back. If you get some bad hypnosis luck or some confusion luck, you can still see a loss pop up here. I picked up the Mint Berry as a precaution here, but I pretty much get everything to go my way here, and I love to see that. You'll just see Polyrath go for back to back hypnosis. It'll miss both, and that just kind of seals the deal and gets us another badge. With access to fly, we can do some backtracking. There are the usual things to do, like pick up a couple of rare candies here and there. And there's a PP up specifically that saves a lot of time during the rocket takeover section of the game. But honestly, this is the first really optimized crystal run that I've done where I considered actually skipping those. I don't, at the end of the day, I don't think that's the call, but as someone who just really enjoys playing the game and like refining it, the thought that this is a possibility is pretty exciting. Let me know what you think about that. Next up is the Rocket Hideout, and I know, guys, we all love this section. We could just watch it on loop all day, but guys, I'm going to skip over it today, and I hope that's all right. I hope you can forgive me. Now we can blitz through a couple of gems, and I got a surprise for you guys. Fury Cutter isn't out of the picture yet. We get to see more Fury Cutter action. I just figured here I didn't really have super effective damage, so I could just take it a little bit slow on the seal, build up a Fury Cutter stack, and just kind of slice through the last two Pokemon. It does work out, and I love to see it. Fury Cutter, what a cool move. And you might ask, hey, what if, shouldn't you just go for return? Wouldn't that be better? And respectfully, I'm gonna have to ask you to sit down. Jasmine is up next, and this was the main reason for the ground hidden power type. I find that more often than not in these playthroughs, you are pretty much picking hidden power for either Jasmine or Lance, and there's really no between that unless you can just deal with them. As good as Scizor felt playing overall, this fight would just be horrendously slow without it. And I'm not saying it would be difficult, it would just be kind of slow. That's gonna give us seven badges, so let's take a deep breath. Let's brace ourselves, because guys, it's time for that dreaded phone call. You already know, we are the only person in the entire Johto region, we are the only person that can stop Team Rocket. I want you guys to leave a like on the video if you wanna see every single Rocket hideout section and times one speed next time, because I think deep down, we all know this is the best part of the game. We just, we like to joke on this channel, guys. I'm a very funny person. Let's get serious for a moment. Let's pick up at the final Johto Gym. And we got the pink bow now, so everyone can just relax. The measure for if this fight's gonna be easy or not is how well you handle the Dragonairs. And with that big, beautiful 130 base attack, we're just gonna be pounding them into the dirt. Kingdra does put up a little resistance. It's pretty good, it's pretty neutral, but the end at this point is pretty inevitable. And just like that, Scizor is ready to look towards bigger and better things. Now I'm going to take a look at the split data a little bit earlier this week. We finished Claire with a 2 hour, 26 minute and 58 second time. And we really don't have a ton of data with these new in-game time metrics except for, well, Fortress. We have Fortress, that's it. If you are curious, Scizor is about an hour and 13 minutes ahead of that. And I would like to ask you guys a question. Um, I don't know what to do with split data. Most of you guys like seeing a couple of split times and me talk about it for a minute and that's fine. But there are some people that say it feels a little incomplete and that maybe I should be comparing these to top runs. I would like to know your thoughts on that because I'm kind of still like in the conceptual stage. I have kind of overhauled my split data formula. It's a little bit complex, probably a little bit too complex for me at this point. But I think that I could probably add in like, I don't know, what do you guys think? Like a top five average time and maybe give the difference uh, how much I'm off of that time, I don't know. With all these different splits, it's kind of hard to do, but I like to talk to the community. Some of you guys are very smart, very knowledgeable. You know what you're talking about. So I thought I would just ask you about it. There's gonna be no extra battles to speak of on the way to the league. And I do end up using all of my rare candies here. We mentioned Swords Dance early and you already know it's gonna be very important to the run, but Scizor also gets double team at level 48. And it might be a little bit confusing, but this is allowed because we learn it naturally. I don't agree with a full ban of double team and I'm gonna treat this just like I would in Gen 1. But it just goes without saying that this move is gonna be very pivotal in the time that we're gonna see at the end of the run, but we'll come back to it. We'll talk about it more but that's the setup we're level 51 and i think we can just dive into the elite four
And I know what you're thinking, big dog. This is the part where the run is about to devolve into just double team and swords dance. And guys, you're smarter than that. Give yourself more credit. You guys know that setting up is incredibly slow overall through the course of a run. And right up here, right up front against wheel, I'm just going to use raw power. I'm not going to set up any time. And I think this is the fastest approach. Now, to be honest, I probably could have used at least one sword stance here, but it's over quick either way. Let's not really waste any more of anybody's time. Next up, we got Koga, and it's going to be a very similar story. But you do have to think about a couple of things in the back of your mind here. Setting up early could open you up to some bad luck with like double teams or something like that. Or if you set up and get confused and start hitting yourself, it could do a lot of damage. So I'm a little bit skittish here, but there's a balance. I just have to find a spot to set up at least once. Everything pretty much becomes two shot ranges after that at, at worst. And it just kind of works out well. Not really much to say about it. Now let's take it straight into Bruno. And here I thought I would just go no setup and just kind of steamroll through the team. What ends up happening is I don't one shot the Hitmon top so when it's underground i use one swords dance and that should be good enough and fun fact here the start of the battle where i used return hit my top went underground and i used swords dance that little bit of time right there took more time than the rest of the battle combined so it's pretty easy the elite four looking like a cakewalk so far not gonna lie to you guys Next up we got Karen and this is the first fight in a long time where we can just straight up lose and it's going to be for one real reason and that's sand attack. So let me get this out of the way real quick. I'm going to use double team one time here because sometimes the AI will look at it. They'll see the evasion buff on you and they'll say, well, it's not worth it to go for a less accurate move. I'll just go for faint attack or something like that. But the bug and steel typing is just so good that the AI just looks at it and they're like, well, this isn't very effective either. So it, the long and short of it here is I still get hit with a sand attack it doesn't matter i don't avoid it i get hit and that opens us up for a possibility to get hit with flamethrower and that's the really the only question of the fight will i miss hidden power ground and will i get hit with a flamethrower now fortunately for us the answer here is we hit the hidden power ground so great perfect and from there the fight's pretty much over it's not really clean i get paralyzed i start missing a little bit because of the sand attack but the hardest part of the fight is already over so it's a done deal and you might be wondering hey why are you going into this battle that's supposed Supposedly kind of tough at half health. It's because it doesn't matter. I'm going to die to a flamethrower no matter what. So the end of the fight, it's a little bit ugly. It's a little bit messy, but we get through. No reset still. Looking pretty good. I think we can just move on to the champion fight. To begin this fight, let me just say that I'm gonna set up two sword stance. It's because I only have resisted return to deal with Aerodactyl, and I just wanna be able to one-shot it because that just sounds kinda of cool to me. We do have Charizard kinda of waiting in the back. It's gonna come out next, but unlike Fortress, and I know I bring that Pokemon up a lot, but I mean, come on, use your brain a little bit. Two Bug and Steel types, easily comparable. You understand. The difference is Scizor just has the speed to not worry about it. I don't have to go out of my way to prepare for the fire types, is what I'm trying to say. And it's just really important that you get that Charizard down quick. I'm pretty Pretty sure even just like a normal return would be do pretty heavy damage one sword stance guaranteed two sword stance overkill like i said i only did it for the aerodactyl and i guess just like with karen there's a possibility that maybe you could miss a range or miss a move or something here or there and you could have like more of a struggle paralysis induced into the fight but i don't think you can lose once you get rid of the charizard that's really the important thing i take a little chip damage in this fight overall just from setting up a couple of times but i can deal with that that's nothing at all and at the end of the fight we get to see a aerodactyl go down to a resisted return which always feels Feels pretty good to me and that's it scissor has become the champion of johto and this was pretty dominant not gonna lie to you guys sitting here trying to edit the footage i was trying to think of ways to like make it interesting and i knew i pretty much only had something to say about karen because scissor just really hits its stride at this point in the game if you can just kind of manage the game up to this point have a pretty good time the rest of the game just starts to flow so we just looked at split time before claire i don't think we want to look at it again instead it's that time we got to take a trip over to kanto so let's fade to black let's get ready and let's go over that really quick
So as far as Kanto goes, we've talked about this a lot. There's not much reason to waste anybody's time. It's a very quick, very easy section. And we'll just, we'll just show the footage right here of Lieutenant Surge. This is kind of like, this is me just off the boat taking the first step into a new land. And this is what the very first gym leader looks like. I don't have to pick and choose. I can just go just like the rest of the run after the hidden power ground. I can go in the most optimal, straightforward path. I don't have to be picky. I don't have any bad matchups. And you might be wondering, I know there's somebody out there, every single video, it doesn't matter if only like five people watch the video or 5,000 people watch the video, there's somebody out there that's saying, what about Blaine? You're weak to fire types. Blaine is a problem, right? No, he's not. We just pull up the footage right here and you're just gonna see, I don't even have to set up. Just go hidden power ground, boom, boom, boom. To be honest, the Macargo would resist return, but I'm pretty sure I could just one shot everything else for the turn regardless. So it's not an issue. And this week I'm not even going to like romanticize or embellish the blue fight. There's no reason to do it. There's no need for the theatrics and let's kind of just jump in. There is one risk that I took here and just a real quick side tangent. I love playing by these new metrics with game time and all that stuff. I'm having a lot of fun with Crystal. It allows me to take some risks that I wouldn't dare take with the old style. And the risk here is not depositing my entire team because there's a chance that Pidgeot can use Whirlwind and you're not going to lose off of that. It's just going to make it very annoying and very slow. So the point here, the main thing you got to come out of this battle with is at least plus two with your Swords Dance. It's going to be very important, all important. You lose if you don't have it. And it's going to be pretty much because of Arcanine. You already know, if you don't get the one shot with a return or a hidden power, it's game over. And we know that this little puppy is pretty thick, so we don't want to play any games. We want to guarantee that one shot, get it out of here. And just like a lot of times we've seen, like with Karen's Houndoom or something like that, the champion fight Charizard. Once you get that threat out of the way, it's pretty much downhill from there. I do actually set up one more Swords Dance here. I don't, I can't tell you why I did. I guess I just wanted to be extra safe. I didn't want to have a reset or anything like that, but I'm pretty sure I was safe. I thought maybe that like Rhydon could just rock my world and just hit super hard. So I'm not going to knock my past self for playing a little bit safe here, but that's pretty much it. And that's the next eight badges down. And there's only one more challenge left. I think you guys know what that is. So thinking forward to red, there might be some questions here. Number one, I have already pretty much exhausted all of my rare candies and I'm nowhere close to outspeeding the Charizard, but I'm not going to grind any extra. And you might be saying, how can that work? If you don't outspeed the Charizard, it's game over, and that's not the case. Scizor is a very unique Pokemon. It has a wonderful little toolkit. It might, on the move list right there, it might look all normal, but it's set up beautifully just to allow us just to go straight to red. I do have a couple of rare candies left, and I will use them. But before we actually get there, I would like to go ahead and just bring up the split data for the final time in the run. We don't need to look at it at the end. And I would just like to talk about the Kanto Gym section of the game. You can see this time, it's, I think this is always going to be your slowest split no matter what. And if you take a look at like the allocation here, I think Jasmine or whoever you do as your seventh gym is always going to be the slowest split going into Claire because you have to do that really long rocket hideout section. And then the Kanto gym section is probably, it's just always going to be the longest. There's eight whole gems to get. But you can see that it's only, it only took us 43 minutes of in-game time, which think about it this way if you're wondering like how does this work. I'm playing on times three speed. So essentially, virtually, every second of real life time is three seconds in the game. So it's pretty quick. It really doesn't take long at all. I would say maybe 25 minutes. So it's pretty fast. I didn't want to touch on that. It's just like, I love collecting this data and I've said this, I don't know, 800 times this video. I only have Fortress data to look back on in this kind of detail on Crystal right now. And as we collect more data, we'll know a little bit more, but I'm pretty sure that this is what a pretty good run's gonna be looking like. So there's really nothing else left to do. Let's equip that, let's put that little hamburger into our claw, equip the leftovers, and I think we can just dive straight into red. So this one is interesting because I just, I don't care about Pikachu. It, it outspeeds me and it's probably going to get off a charm, but Scizor just doesn't care. Let it get off the charm. I'm going to use a couple of returns. It doesn't matter what happens to me because we're going to take it out. I don't care if I have negative 
25 attack. And this is where I would like to say Red makes a mistake, but I know it's just the AI. What he wants to do is send out the Venusaur next. And I guess if I could only surmise why, I could I could deep dive into the AI if I really wanted to, I guess, but I would guess that it wants to set up Sunny Day. It knows that this is a bad matchup. This is like a throwaway Pokemon for him, so he can just kind of throw it in there, set up Sunny Day, and then we can move on to the Charizard. But with two setup moves, this is exactly what we want, and this is pretty much what allows Scizor to have a really high tier run. Like I said earlier, it doesn't matter how many charms Pikachu put on us because we can just set all the Sword Stance up and get to plus six attack. Plus six attack, not even really that necessary. It's just really good to offset the charm. The number two thing is that we didn't outspeed Pikachu. We're not going to outspeed Charizard. And if it hits us, it's game over. So what's the solution to that? Hey, it's double team. This is why double team's banned from a TM because every Pokemon would just learn it. Now we get it naturally here. So it's fair game. And what that allows us to do is to come into this fight under leveled, not outspeed the huge threat in the battle. And we can just set up our evasion and we can just rely on the mist chance it doesn't matter if you can get one shot if the opponent only has like a 25 percent chance to hit you it just doesn't matter so this one stalls out for a while and i'm gonna i'm gonna say something anecdotal i practice these runs several times especially if i'm not sure on a fight i'll practice a specific fight like if i think it's inconsistent i might practice a fight like 15 20 times and from here i noticed that when venusaur sets up sunny day like it made me it, it gaslit me in a way like i had to go look up in the code i went to look up on like websites and stuff like that does sunny day make fire moves never miss because for some reason i would set up six double teams and more often than not and i'm talking like a very high clip guys like 80 percent of the time charizard would just hit me with flamethrower when sunny day was up even if i had plus six evasion it didn't matter it was really frustrating so i think i kind of got like pavlovian conditioned here just to play it safe and have this run be as good as it can be i time everything and i take out the venusaur right on the turn that the sun is gonna fade because i was very superstitious now sunny day doesn't make accuracy increase for fire moves it's just something that just happened here anecdotally it's not true but it felt like it was true and i didn't want to jinx myself i didn't want to make the run any worse i wanted it to be a pretty good run so that's what i do here and we're gonna we spend most of this fight talking about the venusaur so you already know this fight's done charizard's gonna come in boom there is a chance it could hit the flamethrower but we would just do the same thing again and we would keep just playing it out until it went in our favor that is the nature of double team i don't love it but it is what it is with the plus six attack i mean look guys we have 972 attack scissor's little claws are hitting stuff like a shotgun blast point blank and it's over that's all there is to say about it it's, it's over it's a done deal the little espion at the end tries to set up reflect but oh you sweet summer child nothing's gonna nothing's gonna stop you from getting slapped down and that ends the run Scizor finishes with a final time of 3 hours, 42 minutes, and 20 seconds. And I know you're going to look at that up there and see that, hey, that says 342.21. It's because, I don't know, this is too technical. I don't really want to waste time in the video on it, but Gamehook keeps updating and stopping the, the on a frame perfect thing in Gamehook is really hard on the screen. But trust me when I say that I have gathered the data internally from an exact frame, as nerdy as that sounds. But this is a really good run. Since Fortress is the only other data point, this run was just leaps and bounds ahead of it. A 342 time, I suspect, is going to hold up as a pretty good run, if not a really, really, really good run for quite a while. We'll have to see. I'm going to start practicing more crystal, and eventually soon I'll probably roll out some streams to kind of get some stuff caught up so I can actually make some tier cards for you guys because I like them. I know you guys like them, and it's very cool just to see them stacked up against each other. That's like, you know, the whole point of the channel. I will throw up the split data for you guys just so you can look at it. I don't really have much else to say about it that we haven't already said i just don't have anything else to throw up and i would like to say that this video was quite challenging to make now i'm going to go to some behind the scenes stuff if you don't want to listen to this fine click off see you peace out but i recorded like a bunch of videos in advance like before december not videos but like just the footage and i had a couple of things break and i wanted to change some stuff you might notice on the right side i didn't even mention this the overlay for the moves here is updated i wanted to make it more visually accessible and that kind of line of thought went into other stuff like what else can i do what else can i move around so i ended up taking like god taking like weeks to redesign the overlay and redesigning the overlay turned into redesigning the code which turned into me learning other stuff and like 
I ended up just designing stuff from the ground up. And I think maybe if I haven't done it this week, maybe next week, I plan on doing a stream showing off the new overlay. I might even have to take a uh, the week off next week. And I hate I have to do that in December, but there's just been some stuff I wanted to work on on the back end. Like I've been keeping up with content, but like on the back end and the software side of things, I've just been letting it slip. And I need to fully upgrade my front end to work with the new XMLs and stuff. I've been holding off on that, guys. If you want to know, I'm using like a game. I was using a game hook version from like, I don't know, March of this year. So like we're talking like a nine month old version of game hook just so I can have my code work. Because if you update, it doesn't work and I need to upgrade it. I don't know. I don't want to ramble too much. I know I'm losing a lot of you and apologies in advance. This video has been, was very challenging because I had a bunch of stuff come up. Two things I should say. I had a bunch of stuff come up. So I had finals and I had the semester coming up and it's the holiday time. It's really busy. So I had this footage recorded about the end of November, I guess. And it just sat there for weeks. And by the time I got around to editing it, I had already kind of like forgotten the run a little bit. So I had to like watch through the run as if I was doing it for the first time and write down notes. So it took a while to get down. And I had been promising myself I was going to get back to more of this like ad lib improv style of scripting. So I tried that out a little bit with this video as well. So if it was a success, whatever, I, just, I get the feeling that's going to be bloated because I've already like edited like 13 minutes of this video and I'm looking down at my raw recorded footage before I cut stuff out of it. And it's like 38 minutes so not boating well looking a lot it's gonna be a lot of work but i do appreciate you guys special shout out to my patreon members and channel members i don't even think you say patreon members but this was a fun one i really love refining crystal and i can't wait like next week guys brand new overlay everything brand new ground up if i don't have like i think i'm gonna try to do a growl the stream if i haven't done that last week look for it this week i don't know when i'm gonna do it but hopefully i've been transparent and i've been talking with you guys and i'm just rambling at this point my last few videos have been like fully scripted just to keep me like on track so i'm a little bit unhinged here as you can probably tell from that little hidden power part earlier but rarely do i get the outside of a stream rarely do i get the time to like actually talk to you guys because usually it's on a script i say what's on the script and that's it you know thanks for watching bye but now i don't have a script i'm fully unhinged i could talk about anything but i'm not gonna do that i've wasted enough of your time i wanted to get some thoughts out and hopefully the video went well look out for some new exciting stuff on the next video i don't know if we'll have a video next week but the next video should be exciting i should have a bunch of new stuff for you guys go watch the streams playlist all down below if you made it this far jesus you're you're a real one because i have been ranting and raving if you made it to the end of this video please let me know down below and that's all i got for you i'll catch you on the next one bye